greetings and welcome to the 10th, and I'm afraid to say, final episode of the English Heritage History at Home live series. I'm sure we can all agree it's been a weird old time of late, but what a tremendous 10 weeks we've had here. We've enjoyed the fun and fascinating facts, incredible and intellectual interviewees, plenty of painful puns, a checklist of cheery challenges, and a delightful dollop of doggy as well in the shape of my new puppy and sidekick Olive. And guess what? A special guest appearance. Here she is. She's really sleepy. Mwah. And she's up on the sofa. Don't tell anyone. Now, also, I'm sure you'll be aware that with all our historic places closed, it's been a bit of a difficult time for English heritage. So if you've enjoyed watching and you're able to, we'd be really grateful for a donation towards our work to help us secure our historic places for future generations. If you're watching on Facebook, you can use the donate button that will be on the screen throughout. And if you don't want to interrupt your watching, don't worry, we'll leave it on screen for a few minutes after the lesson too. Well, this may be our final lesson, but it's not over yet. We've still got the troublesome Tudors to tackle. Plus, there's a special announcement about a bonus episode on the horizon too. So make sure you stay watching until then when all will be revealed. For now, though, we're back to business as usual. And as usual, I'm broadcasting live from my home in York in England. So please let us know who you are, where you're watching from. And this week, as it's our final lesson, we'd like you to comment on what your favourite history at home topic has been. So keep us posted in the comments below and we'll try and give you a shout out as we go along. As well as shout outs, we'll also be answering your questions on today's topic at the end of the show. So make sure to let us know what's got your breeches in a twist and our expert will be on hand to untangle them, at least metaphorically. Now, as this is our last lesson of the current series, we've got one final creative challenge to look forward to at the end of the show. And in the meantime, we have the superlative submissions from last week's challenge to enjoy. And you'll remember we asked you to do, as Darwin did, venture out into your garden or a local green space and make notes and drawings on your observations. And your notes have proved very noteworthy indeed. This first one is from Sholka Eden, uh, who says, our dog is enjoying the sunshine in a very beautiful English garden. Well, not only enjoying the sunshine, but your dog is also in a deck chair and drinking what looks like a delicious iced drink. I'm very jealous of your dog, and I won't be telling Olive about it because she'll be jealous too. Uh, now, these next three have been uh, fantastic contributors throughout our 10 episodes. They are Ada, Fleur and Darwin. Uh, Ada is 10. They're all from Lincolnshire, by the way, and she's drawn an eagle as she loves birds of prey. She was hoping to see one last year on a camping trip to Scotland, but alas, didn't spot one. Fingers crossed for next time you go, Ada. Uh, she enjoys watching the kestrels, red kites and buzzards uh, that they frequently spot on walks around their village and has done pencil sketches of them as well. Look at that fantastic drawing. Next to her, that's Fleur, who's eight, uh, who drew a blue tit. And she says that they had them nesting in their bird box and were lucky enough to see them fledge a couple of weeks ago. What a privilege that is. And lastly, Darwin, who's six, and he especially loved last week's lesson uh, because he was learning all about his namesake, Charles Darwin, of course. Well, thank you very much, Darwin. We're really glad that you enjoyed it. And you have been getting low down and grubby drawing mini beasts in your garden. We love that too. Uh, here's the Marsden children from Derbyshire who had fun observing and sketching a rock dove nesting in their garden. Look at how happy they are to have seen that. Uh, and last, here we have B who is aged eight. And uh, B is also the name of the girl who's drawn this. So B has drawn a bee. She's been out into her garden to observe the bees in the wildflowers and trees. Uh, and this is the diagram that she's drawn following her observations. And look how detailed it is, and how she's managed to pick out all the different anatomical areas of that bee as well. So B, we loved your bee. Excellent work, everyone. And I'd just like to take a minute to observe how notable your observations and notes were there. Do you get it? Because I'm observing your observations and noting your notes. Anyone? Olive? No, forget it. Also, I'd just like to say a huge and heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken part in our challenges over the past 10 weeks. We've loved setting them and it's been a joy to see you rise to them each and every week and produce such carefully crafted and creative masterpieces. Remember, we've got one more creative challenge to look forward to at the end of today's show. And if you've enjoyed doing them, please do continue to flex those creative muscles beyond this week. I find it really helps to sharpen the mind and nourish the soul, which is always a good thing. 
And uh, someone else who loved nourishment, though more for his stomach than his soul, it has to be said, is the subject of today's live lesson, Henry VIII. And here to discuss what Henry ate, as well as plenty more on the tumultuous Tudors, is Roy Porter. Hello, Roy. Hello, Ben. How are you? I'm great, thanks, Roy. And it's lovely to see you again. Obviously, you've joined us before. Can you tell us what you've been up to since we last spoke? Well, actually, one of the things I've been doing since I was last with you uh, has been working on some conservation projects with English Heritage, one of which is at Bishop's Waltham Palace, which is a palace owned by the Bishops of Winchester in the Middle Ages. And it's a place Henry VIII stayed at. So it's a place he would have known very well. Wow, fantastic. And we'll be talking a lot more about that particular ruler a little bit later on. Uh, our topics, of course, involves the Tudors today as well. So let's kick things off, shall we, uh, by discussing Mr. Tudor himself, the Tudor OG, Henry VII. Now, this is Henry Tudor. He's just won the War of the Roses, which led to him gaining not only all the flowery bragging rights, but also the throne of England. He must have been thrilled about that, Roy. So did the thought of starting his very own Tudor dynasty and naming it after himself really uh, set things up well? Well, that's that's a really interesting point, because actually Henry VII never referred to himself as Henry Tudor. Here's, here's the thing. The Tudors never referred to themselves as Tudors. They, they weren't so keen to promote their Welsh ancestry, uh, but from Owen Tudor. They're far more interested to promote the fact uh, that on his mother's side, Henry is a descendant of Edward III. And in fact, when Henry VII marries Elizabeth of York, they're keen to promote the Yorkist background as well. In fact, Henry VIII is very keen to promote his Yorkist ancestry. So if you're a person living in 16th century England, you wouldn't be thinking of, of yourself as working or living in Tudor England. Uh, the royal family on the throne, well, they're, they're essentially Plantagenets still. And they're descended from Edward III with royal blood coursing through their veins. Hang on, so the Tudors didn't even call themselves Tudors? Well, that's a little bit inconvenient for our Tudor talk, isn't it? It also throws my personal history into question as well, because I was at a primary school where everyone was split into houses named after monarchical dynasties. And I was in, well, you've guessed it, Tudor House, which means I was essentially a Plantagenet all along. I've got a feeling this could end up getting a bit confusing. So for the purpose of clarity, and uh, so I don't have to message all the people in my former schoolhouse to break the bad news. So we just continue to refer to them all as Tudors, Roy. So can you can you tell us who were these so-called Tudors? I, I think we should keep calling them Tudors. It, it is a very convenient label and it works. And we're talking about three generations of monarchs. So we, we've mentioned Henry VII, who becomes king. He usurps the throne, defeats Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. Uh, his son, Henry VIII, becomes king in 1509. And then the next generation, Henry VIII's children, follow him um, in, um, well, Edward VI in 1547, then Mary in 1553, and finally Elizabeth in 1558. So the Tudor period um, lasts from 1485 until 1603. Wow, so uh, a fair old while then. And we saw an image there of Henry VIII, who we're going to be focusing on uh, largely today. And I think that's the abiding image that most people have of him, isn't it? A larger than life character in middle age with this big temper, a big beard and an even bigger belly. I'm guessing those weren't features that he had in his early years. He probably grew into them. So what was his early life like, Roy? OK, well, I mean, what you have to remember about Henry in his earliest years is that he's a younger son. He has an older brother called Arthur who's expected uh, to become king. Uh, and, and Henry is brought up with the, the ladies of the court, in fact. Uh, he spends a lot of time in his childhood at Elton Palace, uh, which is uh, an English heritage property. And you can go and see the, the great hall which Henry VIII uh, would have known when he was staying there. Um, and his life at Elton seems to have been remarkably happy. Um, he was well educated. He, he was close to his mother. We know he was desperately upset uh, when she died in 1503. But really, the big change in Henry's childhood uh, comes in 1502 when Prince Arthur dies. 
and Henry is then catapulted to being the, the next in line to the throne. Um, so he's effectively Prince of Wales. And his childhood changes quite a great deal. He then has to spend far more time with his father, uh, Henry VII, who's naturally concerned that his young son uh, isn't put at risk or in harm's way. So he has quite a sort of suppressed uh, childhood from that point on into his teen years. And he becomes king um, before his 18th birthday. Henry becomes king in 1509 when he's just 17 years and 10 months old. Um, and what a glamorous prince and king he was by that stage. Uh, we know that he was about six foot two inches tall. Uh, we know that he was slender waisted, around 32 inches waist measurement when he became king. Uh, we know that all that education had uh, given him a tremendous uh, ability to um, study. He was a good academic. He was interested in theology. Uh, in fact, he would go on to receive a title from the Pope, the Defender of the Faith, on account of his uh, defense of traditional Catholicism against Martin Luther's uh, revolutionary ideas. Um, he could speak numerous languages. He could speak um, and write in Latin and in French. Uh, he could converse in Italian. He could con converse in Spanish as well. And that put him in very good um, position because, of course, his first wife, who he married in the year he became king, was Catherine of Aragon. And the thing to remember about Catherine of Aragon is that she's a Spanish princess and she had been married to Henry's elder brother, Prince Arthur. So really, I suppose for the first 15 or so years of Henry VIII's reign, you get the impression that here is a virtuous, glamorous prince who enjoys hunting, uh, who is said to be able to tire out 10 horses in one day when he goes hunting. You have the views of the Venetian ambassador of the time saying that Henry was the most handsome ruler in Europe. You have a person who is noted for his grace, uh, who is noted for his ability to write poems, to sing, uh, to play the lute, um, to play the keyboards. I mean, this is a person who, to use an anachronistic phrase, really is a Renaissance man. Wow. So it sounds like Henry's got everything he could possibly want. What could go wrong? Well, we'll be finding out shortly, but for now, it's time for some shout outs. And this week, we've also been asking for your favourite history at home topic too. So let's see what tickled your taste buds. Uh, firstly, we've got hello Ben and Olive from Noah, Tom and Dexter the Border Collie, who are regular viewers from Berry. We're so sad it's the final lesson, me too. Uh, but our favourite session was about Dover Castle. Brilliant, I love that one as well. Uh, hello from Ada, Fleur and Darwin, whose drawings we saw a little bit earlier. They're from Lincoln to remember. Uh, our favourite lesson was about Charles Darwin, but closely followed by Stonehenge. And they're planning to visit both again as restrictions allow this year. Thank you so much. Thank you to you all too. What fantastic uh, viewers and, and engaged young people you've been. Um, Edward's favourite session was King Arthur. His little brother is called Arthur, another namesake there. So they loved watching together and then playing with swords together afterwards. Well, that sounds like a great follow-up. Um, my favourite topic was King Arthur and Tintagel Castle from Isaac, who is age eight. And the Marsden children from Derbyshire are looking forward to visiting Bolsover Castle this Saturday. Fantastic work. And they love the Battle of Hastings history at home. Thank you very much for that. We'll be continuing to do shout outs as we go along, as well as putting your questions to Roy about Henry VIII and the Tudors at the end of the lesson. But Roy, let's just recap, because we've got the young Henry VIII and he's got the world at his feet, hasn't he? Not only is he athletic, musical, handsome, intelligent, thoughtful and married to the delightful Catherine of Aragon, but he's also the king. I mean, what more could he possibly want? Well, actually, there's one thing he desperately wants, um, and, and which he doesn't have at this stage, and that's a son. Uh, he feels that he needs to have a son, a male heir to the throne. Uh, Catherine of Aragon had been pregnant numerous times. In fact, she, she had given birth to a son very early on in their marriage, but sadly that boy had died after a few weeks, and the only child to survive uh, from the marriage was a daughter, uh, Princess Mary. And uh, Henry thought this was a big problem. Now, we, 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 I'm sure all of us will agree that this is an utterly obnoxious idea, that you need to have a son rather than a daughter. But we, we know exactly what Henry thought because there was a pamphlet produced um, in Henry's reign called A Glass of the Truth. And this set out Henry's case. What Henry said uh, was that he needed to have a son because if a daughter became queen, at some point she would have to marry. Of course she would. Women were expected to marry. And if she married, she had a choice. She would either marry 
a king from outside the kingdom, in which case there's a possibility or the probability of foreign influence coming to England. Or if she chose not to marry outside the kingdom, then she'd have to marry from a member of the English nobility, in which case there would be rivalry and possibly tension leading to, well, a, a, an outbreak of civil war, such as we've seen in the 15th century. So then on the screen, you can see a photo there we just did of, of Mary, that was the king's daughter. That's his concern about Mary. If she becomes queen, she, she marries, what's going to happen? Now, interestingly for Henry, he becomes convinced that there is a really important reason why he doesn't have a son. And he becomes convinced that the reason is that he has broken God's laws. Do you remember I mentioned that Henry was a, a noted theologian, he, or so he reckoned anyway. He studied the Bible, he knew the Bible very well, and in the book of Leviticus, it says the man should not marry his brother's widow, and that if he does marry his brother's widow, he shall remain childless. Well, here for Henry was the explanation for his not having a son. Now, of course, he wasn't childless, strictly speaking, but a daughter didn't count. He was without a son. And in fact, some scholars suggested that the, the original Hebrew text meant exactly that. So as far as Henry's concerned, he has broken God's law by marrying his brother's widow. And this means uh, that he will never have a son with Catherine of Aragon. And it seems that Henry becomes legitimately convinced of this argument. His conscience is pricked, if you like. And it means that as far as he's concerned, his marriage to Catherine of Aragon is null and void. Now, just circumstantially, at ex around exactly the same time, in the mid-1520s, Henry's head is turned by a remarkable lady of the court. Uh, I'm sure you all have heard of her. Her name's Anne Boleyn, or Boleyn. Um, and she has returned from France, where she's been brought up there, really, for the most part, as a young lady. And she's turned the heads of many men at court. But Henry, in particular, falls desperately in love uh, with Anne Boleyn. And it's really a combination of Henry's passion for Anne, who refuses to become his mistress and says that you know, she will be his wife, but not his mistress. It's a combination of his passion for Anne and his belief that his marriage to Catherine of Aragon is null and void, which propels Henry down a route which I think nobody would have anticipated when what was known as the King's Great Matter first came public knowledge in the 1520s. Wow, talk about a moody monarch. So Henry's thrown the daddy of all tantrums, essentially, now that he wants a son, even though he already has a daughter perfectly capable of being a ruler herself in the shape of Mary. Mary. And so he decides that the only way to get what he wants is to divorce his current wife and marry someone else, which is very much a case of, it's not me, it's you. Poor old Catherine. It really sounds like Henry has gone too far this time. The only problem is there's one person and one person only who can grant Henry what he wants, and that's a divorce. And that person is the Pope, uh, who Henry uh, has to obey his authority. The Pope says no. Why, surely, for a man who, who puts so much emphasis on his religious devotion, as, as Henry does, that must be the end of the road. The, the leader of the church, God's mouthpiece on earth, the Pope, has said he can't divorce, so he can't do it. Yeah, it's a very big problem, isn't it? Um, and But what happens is that Henry's whole relationship uh, with the Pope and his understanding of what the Pope represents changes radically in the next few years. One of the things which happens in the aftermath uh, of the, the Pope's decision not to, to allow an annulment to this marriage is that Henry sets in train a whole load of research from various scholars who discover by looking through various historical accounts um, that as far, well, a case can be made for the kings of England being the heads of the church in England. Uh, in other words, according to this theory, um, the Pope is no more than the Bishop of Rome. And at some point, the Bishop of Rome has usurped the rightful authority of English kings over the English church. And it's this notion that the kings of England are heads of the English church, which becomes the, the center point of really Henry VIII's world in many respects. This is something he becomes utterly committed to, believes in 
utterly. Um, and in fact, I'm sure if you were to ask him on his deathbed, what was his biggest achievement? It would be this, the fact that he had restored, as he saw it, true religion. Now, much of the religion didn't change in Henry VIII's reign um, in terms of the central tenets of the faith. Um, but it's the fact that he becomes head of the church, that you have some revolutionary changes in other aspects of religious life in the 1530s. But one of the key things for Henry is that as, as head of the church with a new Archbishop of Canterbury in tow, uh, Thomas Cranmer, his marriage to Catherine of Aragon is annulled. And in 1533, he is married uh, to Anne Boleyn. And later in that year, in September of that year, Anne gives birth to their child, Elizabeth, a daughter. But at, the point, at that time, there's no worry about that. They've had a daughter. It's sure that sons will follow. Hmm, interesting. It's uh, amazing what you can uh, find when you want to find it, isn't it? And that was certainly the case with uh, Henry's relationship with the Pope. Uh, so those of you uh, who are paying close attention, you'll realise Henry's on wife number two now, Anne Boleyn. And you'll probably know as well that famously he would go on to have six wives in total. Now, I must point out at this point, we'd love to spend loads of time discussing each of those marriages in detail because each wife could easily an entire episode in her own right. However, because Henry got up to so much horrid stuff during his reign, there just simply isn't the time to do that right now. So instead, we're going to give you a little overview of each of those four wives, but do bear in mind there's so much more to discover about each of them. Now, back to horrid Henry and talk about being desperate to dump someone. Uh, he's gone and started a whole new religion, got rid of the old one, and changed the course of British history forever just to divorce. Catherine of Aragon. Uh, and that's exactly what he ended up doing. So he was so desperate for that son, he divorced Catherine uh, and then obviously remarried uh, Anne Boleyn. And so to give some context of what that decision uh, did to change religion in England, here's a video that explains what monastic life and religious life was like before that decision, uh, right up until the point where Henry dissolved the monasteries. There were many religious communities in medieval Britain. Four of the major movements followed the Rule of St Benedict. The Rule of St Benedict was first adopted in England in the 7th century. By the late Middle Ages, several hundred English monasteries of monks and nuns were living according to this rule. At the core of the Benedictine day was communal prayer, and every day the monks gathered together in church to sing eight services. Time was also set aside for reading and manual work, which might include gardening, cleaning or copying manuscripts. Monasteries also had an obligation to offer hospitality to travellers and alms to the poor. The rule of St Benedict was summed up in the motto, pray and work. In the 11th century, the Cluniacs, a reformed order, wanted a grander style of worship. Their interpretation of the rule called for a celebration of God through beautiful art, architecture and elaborate services. In Cluniac monasteries, servants did most of the manual labour. The Cluniac life was too opulent for the Cistercians. Cistercian monasteries were plain and secluded. Their services were shorter and they farmed and carried out their own manual labour. The Cistercians wanted a simpler, more austere spiritual life. But the Carthusians were the most austere of these orders. Carthusian monks wore hooded robes, only came together for a few services each day and, unlike other orders, they lived and prayed in solitary cells. But in the 16th century came Henry VIII's radical disillusion of the monasteries. Those who'd committed to a lifetime in a religious community were forced to step out into an uncertain future. So, Roy, in that video, we saw monks and religious people living and working and, and generally seeming to have quite a good time in the monasteries. And to be honest, I think I'd make quite a good Benedictine monk because all I've been doing during lockdown is gardening and cleaning. But Henry wasn't such a big fan, was he? So what do we mean when we say he dissolved the monasteries? Did he have to pick them up and drop them in a big glass of water until they started to fizz and disappear? Uh, no, he doesn't do that. I mean, they, they do disappear. That, that, that is very true. Um, but they, they're not dissolved in water. It takes a little bit of a harder effort than that, I'm afraid. Um, you, you mentioned um, gardening and, and, and whatnot. Let's not forget God in all of this. The, the, the monasteries are there 
how the monks in the monasteries are there to pray for the souls of the departed. They're praying for all of us and, and, and the souls of, of, of the faithful departed as well. Um, and so it's a big deal when the monasteries are attacked. And in fact, the monasteries start being attacked in 1536. Uh, 1536 is a big year for Henry VIII. We, we, we shouldn't forget 1536 is also the year which Anne Boleyn is executed uh, after being found guilty of adultery. And Henry marries his third queen, Jane Seymour. And in the midst of this sort of um, family turmoil, uh, the policy of closing down some of the monasteries begins. And at the beginning of this process, they, there's an act of parliament which says that monasteries which are worth less than £200 a year will be closed down. And the justification given at that time uh, was that these smaller monasteries were places where uh, the monks were, had fallen from the ideals of monasticism. Um, which in a lot of cases we know just wasn't true. Um, and what happens is that after the smaller monasteries are closed down, over the next four years, all the larger monasteries go as well. And the photograph you can see in front of you is of Revo Abbey in Yorkshire. This gives you a sense of the scale of these buildings. I mean, there are 800 or so religious houses uh, in Tudor, England. They're all swept aside. Um, they're not simply demolished though. What happens is the King's commissioners uh, go to these monasteries. Um, they make an, a, a record of what they have in terms of their disposable wealth, their gold plate, their vestments, for example. They also make a note of the value of the material of the monasteries. And as the monasteries are closed down, ostensibly volunteering uh, to close themselves down, although actually pressure is applied to them, the King's agents then set to work about making a quick buck, basically. They, they, they start selling off some of the wealth or confiscating it. They start selling off some of the fittings in the monasteries. They take the lead down off the roof so they, the buildings can't be used, but the lead is sold. And then these places become a commodity for Henry. Uh, basically, he starts to sell off the land um, to the gentry and the nobility. Um, and you have a big land grab. Uh, that doesn't mean the people who bought these places necessarily agreed with the attack on the, the, the religion they, they represented. But there's a momentum to this, which, as it builds, means that more and more people start to buy monastic estates, old bits of land, um, old buildings rather, and start to exploit the wealth of these places themselves. But it's this event which makes Henry probably the wealthiest king in English history. It's this event uh, which provides him with a huge cash surplus, at least for a little while. Wow. So these aren't little superficial changes he's making to monasteries. He wasn't just asking them to, you know, alter the curtains or start singing green sleeves every Sunday. He was literally tearing them down, destroying the very basis of their existence. So were people, were the public supportive of this? That That's a really interesting question. I mean... Some time ago, historians would often suggest that the, the reason the, the dissolution happened was because the monasteries were, were in poor condition spiritually, that people didn't really support them. The, the, the consensus amongst historians today is that actual fact, these places were in fine fettle. Um, and that, you know, a, as places of prayer on, on, on the whole, they, they were still highly regarded. And economically, they were still very powerful with you know, lots of land. Um, and in fact, you can sort of test the waters of 16th century England by, by looking at something which happened as a consequence of the monastic policy across the north of England. Uh, in Lincolnshire and in Yorkshire, there was a huge rebellion uh, known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. Um, they actually refer to themselves uh, as pilgrims. And in large part, this was a response uh, to the closure of religious houses uh, across the north. And the fascinating thing about this rebellion is it's so large Henry cannot put it down. He sends his henchmen, if you like, the Duke of Norfolk, northwards to try and deal with this. But they have to come to terms. There's too many people um, rebelling for a royal army to be able to do anything about it. And it's only by sort of making all sorts of promises, and then going back on his word and allowing a second smaller rebellion to happen in various places that Henry's able to wipe it out a year later, quite ruthlessly, in fact. But you know, this, this event, the Pilgrimage of Grace, is, is a big thing. It, it's the closest Henry comes, really, to being toppled from his throne. And it is, in large part, a consequence of the, the policies uh, he and his government are imposing, um, including the dissolution. So Henry's up to his old tricks again, uh hurting people, upsetting them just so he can get his own way. Well, we'll see how that pans out for him very shortly. Uh, but right now, it's time to have a look at some more of your comments. 
Uh, we've got a hello from Saxon and Bowden. Jax and Lula, I think they're dogs, uh, in East Sussex. Uh, uh, they say, our favourite lesson is this one. Hooray! We love the Tudors. And the Battle of Hastings as well, because we live close to battle and visit it a lot. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, also hello from Alicia, who's nine, and Sylvia, who's six, from Hitchin in Hertfordshire. Uh, they've been following our programmes, and their favourite ones have been about Hadrian's Wall and castles. Uh, they're sad that this is the last one. We all are. Uh, but we can't wait to go back to visit your sites. We're booked to go to Rest Park soon. Fantastic. Thank you. We can't wait to welcome so many of you back to those sites. And also thank you to uh, anyone who's donated so far as well. We really, really do appreciate that. Uh, so, Roy, last time we checked in, Henry's dissolved the monasteries, uh, which means he's not only destroyed the buildings, but he's also pinched all the treasure that was inside them for himself too. A process which, as we've heard, might not have made him entirely popular, but it did make him incredibly rich. So what's he doing with all this excess moolah? Did he spend it all on elasticated tights and ever-expanding doublets? Well, well, actually, he did spend a lot of money on clothes. I mean, Henry is an exceptionally flamboyant monarch. He, he knew how to dress well. Uh, he, he loved um, wearing uh, sorry, bling, gold chains, rings, um, that sort of thing. Uh, he's also spending a lot of his money on his houses. I mean, Henry has more houses than any other English monarch. By the time he dies, uh, he leaves Edward, uh, his successor, 60 or so great houses. I mean, he's only inherited 12, I think. So you, you can see how he builds up uh, a huge collection of, of, of um, houses and residences. And he furnishes them um, magnificently. So he's spending a lot of money on, on rich tapestries. And there's gold plate and buffets that display the king's wealth. A sumptuous feasts, which are designed to show off the king's magnificence uh, as well. So he's certainly spending money on himself. And whilst this is happening, that, that sort of rich court, we should remember what's happening at court. Here's a key thing. In 1537, his wife, Jane Seymour, gives birth to her son, who we've mentioned, Prince Edward. There, there's a big thing which happens at this around this time. Sadly, Jane dies 12 days later as a consequence of the complications of, of childbirth. But we mustn't forget the international dimension. I think this is really important because there are, there, there's Jane Seymour on your screen there, um, the person who gave the king his son. Now, internationally, people are aghast at what Henry VIII uh, is doing. Um, and Henry's big concern is that some of the people internationally who disagree with him might try to, to stop him in his tracks, might try to intervene in English affairs. And here's a critical moment in time because there are two really big powerful rulers in Europe and that doesn't that's not Henry VIII. The two most powerful rulers in Europe are Francis I of France and the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V who is also the King of Spain and at the end of the 1530s these two exceptionally powerful figures who for most of their lives are fighting each other suddenly become friends and it seems that there's a real threat that they will unite uh, and follow the instructions of the Pope and invade England and try to reverse Henry's policies, perhaps even topple Henry from the throne. And so Henry's response uh, is inevitably to use some of his uh, newfound wealth to actually try and defend his kingdom. And the way he does that is, well, by building places like the place you can see on the screen, Deal Castle. Uh, in Kent. It's a whole range of fortifications built on the south coast at this time. And these places are built using the money uh, from the dissolution. They're also literally built from the dissolution. A lot of the stone in the construction of a place like Deal Castle has come from ex-monasteries. In fact, you can see some of them today if you go uh, to Deal Castle. And you can see from the photograph, these are not like medieval castles. These are low squat buildings designed to hold a garrison rather than an aristocratic lord. And they're designed to, to be able to repel shot from cannon. More importantly, they're designed to support numerous tiers of guns and cannon. And they're designed to defend landing places and harbours and anchorages where any hostile fleet might try to land and invade England. So there is a where... A, a sort of a, an example of a really powerful response by Henry to the international affairs. Another powerful response, of course, is that he's looking for friends. And it's this looking for friends which results in Henry marrying uh, for a fourth time 
at the beginning of 1540. And the person he marries this time is Anne of Cleves, a, a, a German Lutheran princess. And essentially, he's looking for an alliance with people who will help him in the event of Francis I and Charles V invading. And there is uh, Anne of Cleves, um, uh, not the most successful of royal marriages. Um, this marriage is an old uh, within six months uh, in actual fact, although Anne does rather well out of the deal. Yeah, dearie me. So let's just have a little recap of where we got to. So in the last few years, Henry's initiated the world's most traumatic divorce, remarried and then executed his next wife, fallen out with the Pope, remarried again, founded his own religion, had a son, his third wife has sadly died. He simultaneously destroyed the old religion in Britain and everything that it stood for. He's now having to build castles to repel attacks that he fears might come. He's married again and on his fourth wife, and then they've got divorced. I mean, things are in a, in a state of flux for him on the political scale, aren't they? But one thing that I suppose you can't level against him at this point is he's still a man who is at the height of uh, of his powers, isn't he? Because he's he's got, uh, you know, wives falling at his feet still. He's still making friends. Surely this is a time when he's at his physical and romantic prowess. He's, he's irresistible to women, feared by his enemies. But actually, when you start to look into what was going on in, in, in Henry's sort of personal life and his, his psychology, his mental state at this point, it's not his reputation that's growing, is it? It's his waistline. And uh, he, he's starting to fall apart in more ways than one. So is this the Henry VIII that we start to recognise, Roy, from those portraits that, that we've seen of him? Yes, in a word. Um, the, 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 the most famous portraits of Henry VIII are the portraits of him by Hans Holbein, which are painted in the mid-1530s. Uh, there, we, there we go. There, there, there's a, a very fine portrait of Henry. So th this is the sort of slightly more corpulent figure. I think we'd all identify. I think one of the key things to, to remember about Henry is, as I said earlier, is that he, he was extremely attractive by contemporary accounts, fit and agile for a lot of his life. You know, even into his 40s, again, he has a 36 inch waist um, and he is physically active up until around 1536. And in 1536, he suffers a really major accident. He falls from his horse. Um, and he's knocked unconscious. He's unconscious for two hours. And there's real concern that the king is about to die. Um, and after that um, accident, he, his physical activity reduces dramatically. Um, and this is in part due to the fact that he has all sorts of problems with his legs, which develop over the last decade of his life. Uh, he has open sores, sort of open separating sores which actually smelt if he got close to them on his legs um and you know it could be the result of varicose ulcers could be the result of diabetes but that meant that he his physical his ability to move is diminished and of course henry being henry he, do, he doesn't sort of stop with the food the food continues to be eaten and consumed those magnificent feasts we spoke about earlier continue and i'm afraid he begins to pile on the pounds and as he piles on the pounds the um, effect on his legs becomes ever worse and you have a very vicious cycle and we know that by the time his last suit of armor is constructed for him what had been a 32 inch waist is now a 54 inch uh, waist measurement so he has grown considerably also allied to all of these things appears to be some you know, rather disturbing psychological dis uh, um, developments uh, as well henry appears to become increasingly uh, paranoid about threats at court, threats to the succession of, of his son. Um, he's also absolutely concerned um, that his royal supremacy of the church should be defended at all costs. And some of the more grotesque and and uh, just frankly horrible um, attacks on rival claimants to the throne and on people who oppose his religious policies are carried out in this period. Uh, he does marry again, of course. There, there he is. And there's a fine. Think of him as a husband to a young teenager. He marries Catherine Howard uh, in 1540. Uh, and that marriage, I'm afraid, doesn't even last two years. Um, Catherine um, probably um, was indiscreet, shall we say. She was certainly accused of adultery, um, found guilty, and she was executed. And Henry was distraught uh, when this happened absolutely distraught and psychologically it seems to affect him a great deal perhaps there's a sense in which this uh um 
aging fat man realize he, he, he wasn't quite as attractive as he had been uh, in the past. And we, we, by contemporary accounts, he becomes depressed. Um, he does marry one last time, 1543, he marries Catherine Parr. Perhaps he finds some solace uh, with Catherine Parr. Um, she's able to discuss religion with him in a respectable manner. Um, she is also able to act as a sort of stepmother uh, to his three children. And you get a sense that you know, at the very end of his reign, you know, the three children and this sort of royal family are probably the happiest they have been uh, for a very long time. But you're absolutely right, Ben. We're talking about a, a decline which you know, in the last few years of his life is extremely rapid. I'm afraid things reach ahead when this corpulent king who can no longer walk around and is pushed around in what were called trams, effectively wheelchairs, around Whitehall Palace and had a winch to carry him up the stairs. This king dies on the 28th of January of 1547, a, a physically a wreck. Well, it's a sad end uh, for Henry, but in a way, it's uh, nothing less than he deserved for all the upset and the trauma that he caused so many people throughout his life. I mean, don't forget, he, he had two of his wives killed. Um, but I, I suppose for Henry, would he have viewed his life as a success at the end? Because we talked at the beginning how desperate he was to have that son, a male heir, to waddle in his footsteps, continue his dynasty. And he got what he wanted, didn't he? So was Edward everything his father had hoped he would be? Well, as far as Henry was concerned, of what he knew of Edward, he was everything he hoped he could be. You often read um, accounts of, uh, from, from um, historians saying that uh, Edward was a sickly child. Um, in fact, there's, there's very little evidence to suggest that was. As far as Henry's concerned, Edward is healthy. He, he will become king. And he does become king. There is Edward, look there. King um, from 1547 onwards. And as far as Henry's concerned, he's done it. You know, he has secured a male succession. Male succession. Um, he's left a will in place which governs how the kingdom should be ruled whilst Edward is a boy. Because remember, Edward becomes king, but just the age of nine uh, in actual fact. So he can't rule in his own name uh, yet. But everybody expects that Edward will grow up and will become as glorious a king uh, as his father. Of course, we know that that didn't happen. Uh, in 1553, the young Edward died and he is followed uh, by his eldest sister uh, or half-sister, Mary. And oh my goodness, everything Henry VIII uh, was concerned about happens a daughter becomes the queen what's interesting about this um is that you know that there's there's no sense in which uh, mary um is not able to take the throne because she's a woman but what she does face are some of the difficulties henry viii anticipated that those concerns about who she should should marry in fact she marries the king of spain philip ii of spain and that does cause some dissent in the kingdom there's a rebellion uh wyatt's rebellion which happens in early 1554 so some of the things uh, which henry is concerned about uh, do actually eventuate but mary is only queen for five years um she dies in 1558 and then henry's other daughter elizabeth uh, becomes queen and she will reign until 1603 uh, known to history of course as the the, the virgin queen um, in fact at the beginning of her reign um, there were a number of occasions when it looked like she was close to marrying but I think I, I, I think Elizabeth looked at what had happened to her sister Mary and all the difficulties associated uh, with marriage for her and also her cousin Mary Queen of Scots and the disasters which befell her as a consequence of marriage and that this fueled her determination really to rule in her own right throughout her reign and that meant not marrying and I think that that explains a lot of what happened uh, with Elizabeth and of course one of the grand ironies is that you know for most people today if we were to say what was the golden age of of Tudor England they would think of Elizabeth's reign rather than Henry's and although in actual fact Elizabeth's reign was anything but a golden age for many of the people living through it uh, because of all sorts of horrible social and economic difficulties by the 17th century people were looking back at Elizabeth and saying what a glorious monarch she was. Well, you, you're right to say it's ironic, Roy, because for someone like Henry, who dedicated his life and literally changed the whole underpinning of a country in order to avoid having a woman as his heir, he ended up producing two queens, uh, Mary and Elizabeth, and spent essentially his whole lifetime surrounded by strong and influential women. So you, you could make a very strong case to say that it was the women in Henry's life who actually shaped it. 
that's a really interesting point, isn't it? I mean, I mean yeah, as you said earlier, Ben, we've given short shrift to the women um, in this story because we've concentrated on Henry VIII. But you know, throughout his life, he is surrounded by important um, female um, sort of, um, not so much role models, but people who care for him, teach him, um, and are politically important as well. So you think of right at the beginning, I mentioned he was very close to his mother, uh, Elizabeth of York. Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn are indomitable people. They they are you know, politically very now full of political nouns. They know what they're doing. They they are leaders at court. Um, they are people who are relatively well learned as well. I mean, Catherine of Aragon is very keen for her daughter Mary to be uh, well educated, for example. Um, so yes, Henry is um, sort of um, surrounded by women with really sort of vital characters and, and people who deserve to be remembered in their own account, not simply as sort of people who stand in the shadow of Henry VIII. It always distresses me that, you know, for example, Anne Boleyn is remembered for the most part because she had her head cut off. Well, you know, isn't it a shame to remember her because of this judicial murder, effectively? Let, let's remember these people uh, in their own right. And as you said, Ben, if we had hours and more programmes to, 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 to play with, we could look at them properly. But it is a delicious irony, isn't it, that Henry VIII, who um, presented, as I said earlier, this what we would regard as an obnoxious idea that daughters weren't as important as sons, is followed by two of his daughters on the throne. Um, and it's his you know his second daughter who as i say is arguably the more glorious monarch than henry himself in the popular imagination absolutely well if only we did have hours roy but sadly we run out of time uh, at least for our bit of today uh, thank you though for being such a fantastic tudor shooter <laughs> Uh, now, luckily, we've still got a few minutes left, uh, and that does mean that we can take your questions for Roy. So let's see what you've been asking about the Tudors. So Lily, uh, who is eight, Roy, asks, which wife did Henry love the most? She also says she'll miss our programmes. We will too, Lily. Uh, but yeah, can you can you make a judgment call on on which wife he cared about the most? That's a really good question, Lily. Thanks for asking that. Um, I, 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 I suppose one answer would be that it depended when you were asking the question. You know, in say 1509, 1510, 1515, even up to 15, the early 1520s, Henry appeared to be very much in love with Catherine of Aragon. That said, I think the great passion of Henry's life, there's Catherine there, but the great passion of Henry's life has got to be Anne Boleyn. I mean, it's his passion for Anne which um, propels him along the route we've been discussing um, this morning, um, which you know, eventuates in, in, in the, the, the official English Reformation, you know, Henry's, uh, uh, Henry's great religious changes in order to allow him to marry uh, Anne. That great passion has to be said, you know, by, by th after three years of marriage, it's become a, a quite an antagonistic uh, relationship and, and results in great bitterness. Um, perhaps perhaps we, we ought to remember though, you know, what Henry VIII himself uh, does. And um, there's a marvellous um, painting which, um, of, of Henry's family, painted in the mid-1540s. And Henry is in the centre with his son, and out on the edges of the painting slightly are his daughters, Mary and Elizabeth. And sitting next to him is his queen. And the queen who should be there, of course, is Catherine Parr by that stage. Um, but she's, she doesn't appear in the painting. It's actually Jane Seymour. Who appears in the painting and jane is there of course because she gave henry his son she gave him prince edward and she's given pride of place even though she's been dead for several years in this portrait and we should also remember i suppose that it's next to jane seymour that henry the eighth was buried in 1547 so perhaps the um if you take if you put aside passion and romantic affection the person he perhaps loved the most because she gave him what he so desperately wanted was Jane Seymour um, in giving him Prince Edward. Wow, uh, that's got to be a pretty painful burn for Catherine Parr as well, not even being painted with your husband. Um, now, we've got a question here from uh, Strephon Duckering, Roy, who asked, what happened to the religious communities, the individuals, the monks and the nuns, uh, when they'd been turned out? Right, yeah. I mean, 
th again, this, this, this is very interesting. Um, there were pensions available for some of them. So most of the abbots get pensioned off uh, uh, and uh, able to live on their pensions. Um, what, what, what's really fascinating, uh, and, and you know, you'd say you know, possibly slightly hypocritical, is that Henry insists that the ex-religious continue to live religious lives. They're not allowed to marry, for example. They, they have to continue to, uh, to, to follow their, their oaths. Um, so the, 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 um, the monks um, are, are pensioned off, but those people who had um, been servants working for the crown aren't as lucky. Uh, not the crown, rather, servants working for the monasteries. And remember, the monasteries employed lots and lots of people. Those people get nothing. There's no sort of redundancy package. Suddenly, their their employment uh, has, has has come to an end, and unless they are employed by the people who purchase uh, the monastic estates, um, they're going to suffer economically as a consequence of the dissolution, uh, and and also all sorts of people who had enjoyed um, rights to live on monastic land suddenly find themselves as tenants on royal land, and they're expected to pay for the privilege for the most part as well. So I'm afraid that you know. Um, Apart from the the official religious living in, in in the monasteries, some of whom are given quite comfortable pensions, many of which are actually given a, a, a pittance in, in comparison. Um, most other people who are associated with the monasteries are going to get an out from it, um, and in fact, there's just an invitation uh, to to purchase. Although in some instances, people um, rather secretly looted these places as well and took advantage of what was happening uh, in in order to um, you know sort of feather their own nests. Wow, Henry really was the master of do what I say, not what I do, wasn't he? <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Well, we've got one more question here. Uh, this comes in from Joanna Stanwell, Roy. She asks, which was your favourite daughter and why? I presume that is in reference to Henry's daughters and not any of your own children. So, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I guess Mary and Elizabeth, do you have someone that you'd choose? Um. Do you know, I, I, uh, th this is a really tricky question for me because I, I studied the reign of Mary Tudor at university. Um, and so you know, I have um, a, a sort of a sneaking regard for Mary, despite the fact that she has had a very bad press. And perhaps I have a more affectionate regard for Mary because you know, she, she, she had a really horrible relationship with her husband, um, Philip II. Um, she she really was really desperate to get pregnant and and thought she was pregnant, had phantom pregnancies. And I think psychologically she 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 was really quite damaged by Henry VIII's um behavior towards her. You have to imagine that when he um decided that his marriage to her mother was over, you know, Mary was a young lady and you know lots of pressure is put on her. She's she's not allowed to go and see her mother um when her mother is is dying, for example. And I think Henry's treatment of Mary. Um, is absolutely atrocious. So I have a great deal of sympathy uh, for, for Mary, um, and you know, I sort of wear that on, on my heart. Um, despite the fact that lots of people were killed during her reign for disagreeing with her religious policies, we have, do have to remember that as well. But of course, you know, in t in terms of success as a queen, I suppose ultimately, you know, she's going to be shadowed by Elizabeth, uh, who reigns for the rest of the 16th century, um, and you know manages to to, to 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 propagate this 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 image of herself as being a you know an extremely virtuous and powerful monarch um and it's hard not to be impressed by by the success of elizabeth um in terms of individual personalities yeah i think both of them would be quite interesting to have for dinner um but i'm not sure i'd want to spend any great deal of time in the company of either um because both of them had a uh, they both of them inherited the irascible temper of their father. And I think that would be a frightening thing to see uh, in the full blow. So I'm hedging my bets. Yeah. The last thing you want at a dinner party is to lose your head. Uh, well, thank Absolutely. you for all your incredible questions. And uh, Roy, it has been a joy. Thank you for allowing us to end this series on a high. It's been so lovely to spend some time with you again. Thanks a lot, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Brilliant. Well, look, everyone, I'm afraid we're almost, almost at the end uh, of both today and the current series. Before I say goodbye, uh, there is time just to tell you a couple of last things. The first of those is about our final challenge. Now, 
For this challenge, we want you to write down or draw uh, or just put it in a comment, your favorite historical facts that you've learned from these lessons. Uh, or if the lesson has sparked your interest, maybe it's something that you've gone on to learn since. Uh, my fact, for instance, well, it's got to be gong farmers, hasn't it, that we learned about in our first Castles episode. Uh, remember, they were the people who dug out and removed human poo from the privies and cesspits where uh, toilet waste falls into around castles. Their actual job was to shovel other people's poo. Sounds great, doesn't it? Um, well, uh, we'd love to know what your favourite historical facts have been. So look out for the photo of me. I'll be holding up my fact. Uh, it'll appear on Facebook and you can comment under that with your fact uh, and you can draw it or you can write about it as well. We'd love to see that. And, uh, and last but by no means least, of course, this may be our last episode of Live Lessons, uh, but it isn't quite the end. Uh, we are going to have a very special bonus special episode for the Festival of Archaeology where our expert Matt Thompson uh, will be talking to you about what it's like to be an archaeologist. So if you've ever fancied yourself as a bit of an Indiana Jones type, uh, join us on Wednesday the 15th of July at 11.30 a.m. Uh, now, well, this really is the end, and I'm so sorry because I know loads of you have been getting in touch with us, I've been told on the comments on Facebook and Twitter, etc., to say how, how much you've enjoyed the series and how sad you are uh, that we're going off air. Well, we've loved it too. Uh, firstly, can I say a huge thank you to all of you for watching, for tuning in, for, for being so engaged and enthusiastic. It's made our job so much easier to know that you all care so much and have enjoyed it so much. I'd also like to thank uh, the people at English Heritage who've been so busy behind the scenes. You won't have seen them, but they're the people who've helped to put this all together. So Martin, uh, Charlie and Abby and Kate have been incredible, as have all our superb experts who've been so patient helping me to understand these subjects when we have our run-throughs beforehand uh, and make sure that you get the absolute best possible information during these live lessons. I've loved it. I've loved sharing Olive with you as well and seeing all your incredible creative challenges. Uh, we are going off air for now. It is the summer holidays that are approaching. So that's the reason why we want to give you a bit of time to enjoy the sunshine, hopefully, fingers crossed, wherever you are in the world. And, and also to, uh, to just recharge your batteries, maybe get outside and see some of these amazing historical places. And who knows? Maybe someday, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be back again to do some more of this. Uh, do let us know if you want us to continue and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And remember, you can watch all of the past 10 episodes on our Facebook page or on YouTube where they're saved in our past videos. And if you missed any of the challenges or you just want to give another go at them, uh, please do send us your photos on social media because we love to see them too. But for now, thank you so much. Thanks for watching. I've loved interacting and engaging with you all and I'll hopefully see you soon. Goodbye.